Welcome back to the Diet Doctor podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Brian Lenskis, and this is a special episode for me because we trained together way back when, when we were internal medicine residents, before we sort of got into the world as real doctors, so to speak, and certainly before we came on the, the our low-carb journey. But we each found low-carb for different ways and different reasons, but it, for both of us, it transformed our practice and transformed how we impact our patients. And now we're both trying to spread the word to as many patients as possible and as many physicians as possible. So we spend a lot of time in this episode talking about that. And we mentioned the Diet Doctor CME course, a continuing medical education course that is out there and is free. And we want as many doctors to participate in just as part of our mission to educate the world about the benefits of low carb, but also in, an, in, a, in a responsible way in a trustworthy way. And I think that's where Dr. Lenskis talks a lot about um, about how to know when you're really impacting patients and how to help other physicians see that as well. I think he's got a wonderful perspective. He's a, a, a witty, intelligent guy who has his own podcast too at Low Carb MD. So definitely check him out. And I hope you enjoy this episode. And you can go to dietdoctor.com to see the full video and the full transcripts and, of course, all the other membership benefits of being a Diet Doctor member. So enjoy this interview today with Dr. Brian Lenskis. Hey, everybody. Quick break from the interview here. I just wanted to let you know about some of the features we have at Diet Doctor that you may not be aware of. Did you know we have an iPhone app? And on this app, you can either sign up for a yearly membership. You can have access to um, meal plans um, and recipes and lots of features that you can get either at our website at dietdoctor.com, now available just in the convenience of an iPhone app. Now, for you Android users, don't worry. We're working on getting one of those too, and we should have one soon. But it puts all the, the benefits um, and the functionality of Diet Doctor on your phone and in your pocket. So if you haven't checked it out, please go ahead and go to the App Store. Check out that Diet Doctor app. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. All right, now we'll get back to our interview. Dr. Brian Lenskis, welcome to the Diet Doctor Podcast. Brett, thank you so much for having me, man. It's an honor. Yeah, it's great to have you. I mean, I, I, I got to say, I love having all my guests on. Everyone's been amazing. But this is so special because we go back, gosh, what is it, like 20, 25 years here where we were residents together, just fresh out of medical school. Actually, I was one year ahead of you. And you were an intern when I was a second year resident. And here we are sort of learning to be doctors, this big, wide, open world, and we're, we're learning so much about how to help people. And a lot has changed since then, hasn't it? Yeah, we've been through a lot. You know, you were yeah. the chief resident the year before me, and I got to take over the reins That's and try right. to get some of your wisdom. It didn't That's rub right. off on me. It took me a while to catch up with you, but yeah, but yeah at we're that seeing time, changes. Yeah, like put yourself back in that mindset, right? Like when you're a chief resident and you're, you're about to embark on your career as a doctor, and you think of all the people you're going to help, all the impact you're going to have on people's lives. And then when you get out in the real world, sort of what happened? What did you notice when you first started practicing about the impact you were having? Well, we have our nice white pressed coats, and we're there going to save the world, right? And yeah. then I think once you get into the reality of life, you realize, first of all, a lot of people aren't going to take your advice, right? And they're going to have their lifestyle that they're going to have. And they know it's detrimental to them, but they continue to do it. And then we try to fix that by throwing more drugs on to fix the problem. You know, so I think a lot of us get disillusioned. We talk a lot about physician burned out. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot because doctors think they're going to save the world. Then they realize a lot of times people don't even listen to them. Or if they do, we're giving bad advice. So we have to figure out how to help our patients again. Well, that's the thing. So now let's get into your transformation, right? You, You leave residency and you start practice and I'm sure it was a calories in calories out eat less move more here's your prescription type of practice which is what we're taught right it doesn't mean it's necessarily evil but that's just how we're taught to practice but then things changed for you so bring us up to speed on on how that changed and why that changed for you Well, for me, weight was always an issue. I come from a family where everyone has diabetes. They're from Ohio, and they're eating their bad food. And they say, well, I'll just take some Lipitor, and then I can eat all the cholesterol I want. I'll just shoot some more insulin and then eat all the sugar I want. So for us, you know, once you start getting to practice, you realize a lot of people are doing that. They think if they take that magic pill that is going to fix their blood pressure, their diabetes, and all this, that that they're just going to be healthy and and they can do whatever they want. You know, we're kind of looking for that magic pill. You know, people say, what's that magic pill for weight loss, right? They'll ask me, and I'm gaining weight every year. Mm. I'm eating six small meals throughout the, the day. I'm exercising six days a week, and I'm gaining three to five, seven, ten pounds. So... 
two years ago, I was 40 pounds heavier than I am now, right? So I, I had a patient come in and I asked him what he was, I always ask patients what they're doing. And, you know, our typical advice was eat six times a day, never skip breakfast, you'll go into starvation mode, right? <laughs> and just exercise more and everything will work out. And so when you see a patient come in and he lost 40 pounds, the first thing we think of, because we never see that is, uh oh, he might have cancer or something, right? right? And then he told me he was doing this crazy fast diet where it was like two days a week, he would eat 600 calories or less. And the other days he would eat whatever he wanted. And on those two days, he would eat very low carbs. And I'm trying to figure it out from a medical perspective, say, well, if you're eat, if you're eating 600 calories, the next day you must be starving all day and want to eat all day. And he said, no, it's weird. I'm not hungry. He says, it's really strange. He said, I don't, I force myself to eat that next day. I said, well, that doesn't really make sense. So I start researching fasting and who comes up? Jason Fung. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, looking at that and him talking about insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and all these things that we're fighting with drugs. And he's saying, it's a lifestyle issue, you know? So I, I started applying that to my life and I started losing weight and I start feeling better. My focus is better. My energy is better. And so I started realizing, gosh, I've been giving bad advice and I've been given bad advice. I remember when I first listened to Jason Fung, I said, if this guy's right, I'm going to be super mad because everything I've been doing has been detrimental. Yeah, let's right. talk about that for a second. Like, how does that feel as someone who has been giving advice to people? And that's our job as physicians, to give advice to people to improve their lives. And all of a sudden you think, oh my God, I've been doing it wrong and telling people the wrong things. Like, how does that feel inside you? Yeah, it's hard because that's what we were always told. Yeah. And when you find out there's no research that says, yes, this is the way we should do it, it's mostly opinion, and we just hand opinion down. We know in residency that the attending physician tells us how things are, and we just accept it as truth, yeah. rather than looking at it and saying, okay, are my patients getting healthier or are they getting sicker? And am I getting healthier or am right. I getting sicker? So at some point, we have to step back and analyze that. I think I had the advantage or disadvantage of always struggling with weight my entire life, right? Because I played football and I wrestled in high school, so I would lose 40 pounds and gain 40 pounds because I was small to play defensive line, but I had to lose weight for wrestling because you have an advantage to be thinner. Right. So I always assumed I just messed up my metabolism during that time and that it was kind of a hopeless thing, right? And I would just always have to be struggling with it and ultimately getting diabetes. I think a lot of us think that we're just going to get diabetes, we're going to have to take blood pressure medicines and be sick as we get older, mm -hmm. right? So I think when you start realizing, no, that's not true, we can reverse the ship, we can take steps and impact our own health. And it's not going to be a drug deficiency that we have. It's right. lifestyle a lot of times. Yeah. That is one of the things I think is so interesting is this concept of admitting we're wrong, admitting we have been wrong. I mean, let's face it. When we were residents, we had amazing teachers. We had amazing attendings. They were, they were smarter than anybody. They were great at clinical practice, but they only know what they'd been taught too, right? So it's, it's, this teaching has been passed down. And when you have that awakening to say, wait a second, maybe we're not doing this right, it's hard to admit. And I think the reason why I'm making such a big point about this is because one of my questions for you is how do we get more doctors to, to realize that there's another way out there. But part of that comes with admitting we've been wrong, which is hard to do. So um, I guess I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but what's your experience been now that you've been practicing low carb, working with your patients, seeing success, how are other docs looking at you and, and reacting to you when they see what you're doing? Yeah, it's a process. You know, I think you have to stay the line and you make the points, you show the labs, you know, you go through and, and try to educate. That's what yeah. we have to do. The problem we have, like I was starting to get to, is like a lot of docs have been thin, in shape their whole life. So right. they've never had the struggle. Right. Now I have trochilasians who've lost, you know, 150 pounds. I have all these docs who've struggled. Then they changed what they were doing and they got better. So now they're obligated to tell their patients about it, right? So I think at some point you have to assess. Now if it doesn't work, you know, we're always tweaking. I'm always tweaking my diet now. Say I'll, I'll add in fat, take out fat, I'll fast more, fast less. Trying to figure out what works for me. I think that is the big take home message is there's not a one size fits all. So to have a food pyramid where you say everyone eats the same thing, it's what you can eat is going to be different than what I can eat. You know, I yeah. have to be super low carb to maintain weight. Otherwise I'm a, on a, a trajectory tor course towards diabetes. So I think that's, uh, you know, it's important. I think how do we reach other docs? I think by, by being reasonable and bringing more docs who are reasonable into the fold, right? When I heard about you doing low carb, I was blown away, right? Because I thought, man, how can, how can this cardiologist take this risk talking about low carb? Because most of us, 
we'll just kind of keep it quiet because it's taking a risk. You know, when we first started talking about this stuff, no one knew about it. And it was certainly fringe. Yeah. Now you're going down the street. We were just talking about how, you know, you go to different restaurants and they'll, they'll have a keto menu now because obviously it's working. Right. People are having benefit. And I think what happens for us is that uh, the patients are educating their doctors now. I got educated by a patient, right? Right. So if I told him he was going into starvation mode, well, he lost 40 pounds and I'm overweight, right? What am I, what am I going to tell him he's wrong? Right. Right at that point. And I thought, man, all the Melba toast I had and rice crackers and all these kind of things, you start realizing I was being, I was just spiking my sh insulin and sugars up and causing myself more problems, not even enjoying it, drinking green shakes that I didn't enjoy in the morning because I thought I was benefiting myself with nutrients, right? Right. So I think when you start changing and, and seeing a difference, then you start realizing we have an obligation now to get the word out. So getting new docs, I think the more people like you who have credibility and weigh the evidence and it's not just an emotional reflex, you look at it because you have a responsibility to your patients. And I think more docs like that who weigh the evidence and say, wow, I think we've been wrong. Yeah. Right? And here's what my data and here's what my clinical experience shows. There's value to that. Yeah, it's so interesting when you have the personal experience that then will set you on the course to help your patients. But if you don't have that personal experience, the, the inspiration or the motivation needs to come from somewhere else. And so frequently that will be from the patients. And that's why I tell every patient who's had success with low carb, tell your doctor about it so that they can, they can find, they can look into it more. And, and actually, as we were talking before, we've got diet doctor has this CME course coming out now that we just want every doctor to take to learn more about low carb and it's free. Anybody can take it. So, so more doctors have this in their toolkit. So once you put it in your toolkit and once you realize this was the way you wanted to practice, how did your practice change? What did you notice different? Well, I'm having a lot more fun now. You know, when my labs come in, I'm excited because I see the benefit. I see people coming off insulin. You know, I've had a number of people come off insulin, coming off blood pressure medicine. So we're yeah. deprescribing now for the first time in my career. You know, I was doing this for how long were we out there before we started doing this stuff? You know, yeah. 13, 15 years. Right. And now all of a sudden people are getting better. They're coming yeah. off meds and they're excited. They go, hey, doc, did you see my weight? Hey, doc, did you see my blood pressure? You know, did you see my labs yet? And they're excited. They're happy to come in. They're not avoiding me and saying, oh, I don't want to go in and see them. And, you know, that's one of the things we could tell. If someone doesn't come in for a few months, you think, uh oh, they fell off the wagon. We're going to have to reach out to them. Right. And and it's surprising. The thing that surprises me clinically is some people are it's just like a religion or just like having a new experience. People are super gung ho. You know, in the office, they're fired up and you go, they're going to be super successful. And then they flail out. You know, mm -hmm. they, they get into life struggles, stress and all that. And then other people, I just mentioned it in passing, and they just take the, the bulls by, bull by the horns, you know, and just yeah. take off. And they have unbelievable success. Right. So it's just, a, you know, we can't predict. And some, I have a lady who's in her 80s that lost a ton of weight. I have a guy who's 80 years old now, lost 46 pounds, came off diabetes meds, came off his blood pressure medicines. And I have a picture of, you know, him holding out his belt, showing how, how loose his pants are now right. in his 80s, right? I mean... And he feels great. He's at the YMCA making new friends. He's working out again. And before he was just sitting on the couch watching TV. So when you see those changes, it's very exciting. You know, it gives us hope for the future, you know. Yeah, I love how you said your practice is now more fun. And it's not that it's all about us having fun, but we have fun because we're helping more people and we're seeing the success in our patients. And I, I think that's amazing. And I, I love the way you said that. But how many people in the first... 13, 15, whatever it's been, years of practice. How many people did you take off of insulin? Zero. How many people did you take off of blood pressure medicines even? Yeah, we didn't. Not many, yeah, right? it would be very, very unusual yeah. for that to happen. Zero. And the same for me. Like the concept of taking somebody off of insulin was just like, no, you wouldn't even like think about it. But now... How often do you take people off of insulin? Yeah, it's happening frequently. And, yeah. you know, I've taken people off and then they go back on. They go through a life stress. And now I have a lady uh, that went back on insulin for a little short time and now she's off it again. You yeah. know, because she realized, oh, my goodness, my diet makes a difference. Mm -hmm. When she went back to her comfort foods and stress, you know, re reduction techniques that weren't healthy for her, right. then she realized now she's gung ho and going for it. You know, right. she realizes that she gains weight on insulin. She feels poorly. Her energy's down. Her mood gets worse. And once she's off all that, everything gets better. Yeah, so this whole concept of diabetes is not just a chronic condition that's going to require more and more medications. It's, it was so new and, uh, and now it seems not so new anymore, right? Like it should be commonplace. Well, I think people like Jason Fung, you know, Dr. Unwin, 
you know, when they have credibility, say, these guys have credibility. I had to weigh it myself and look and say, are these guys nuts? Are they selling me a product? No, mm-hmm. they're just saying, look, I'm having benefit. I want to help other people. So, you know, Dr. Unwin took him 25 years. I was teasing him. I said, it only took me 15. It took you 25 years to figure this stuff out. But <laughs> he was burned out and ready to retire. What a, yeah. what a loss that would have been to medicine, right? right? Now he's impacting these people and doing exactly the opposite of what we've been saying and having great clinical success. You know, so when you see that and you see he's a peaceful, you know, loving guy and his, his patients probably don't want to disappoint him. So he has a better success rate, I think, than most people. But I think part of the problem is we've been told diet doesn't work because we've given bad diet advice. So they say, well, spend two minutes talking about diet, then tell them what drugs are gonna fix the problem, right? That's just the way it is, because that's the reality we faced. Right. But now we're, we're in a new paradigm. We're in a new era where we can uh, impact patients. You know, we can yeah. help them get along. And, and I think when people hear, hey, I've had 15 people come off insulin, they think, well, why can't I do that? There's mm-hmm. hope. And Dr. Unwin he talks about that of having hope to say, yeah, this isn't a, a chronic progressive disease. We can reverse it. Not we, you're going to have to do it, but let me help you with tools. You know, maybe it's going to be getting more active. Maybe it's watching the stress, getting enough sleep. It's not just one thing. It's not just what you're putting in your mouth, but it's the whole lifestyle approach that we're missing out on. Yeah, great great point. We, we still need to talk about exercise. We still need to talk about stress. We still need to talk about sleep because those impact every part of your life and it impacts the decisions you make for your nutrition. So it's all interrelated. Um but I, I, it's a good point you bring up about about Dr. Unwin. Gosh, that would be that would have been terrible if he would have retired before finding low carb and revitalizing his career. The other day, somebody asked me, "Come on, is he really like as nice and as kind and as gentle and as wonderful as he seems on his interview?" And I said, "Yes, that is him to the T. I mean, he is just such a wonderful individual, and like you said, a just a tremendous role model to say this is what I've done." This is how I've helped my patients. And here's the data. I love these collecting data and putting data out there. So let's transition to f- for a second about low carb and data for physicians. Some can see it as, as fringe. Some can see it as you know a total fad that is, is not backed by science. But that's not the case. So again, why, why do you think there's that disconnect that people aren't quite recognizing the data that supports low carb? Yeah, I think it's a hard thing. I think it's because we've seen so many fad diets come from TV doctors that have come and gone. Yeah. So a lot of docs say, look, I'm not wasting time learning about this because it's going to be gone in a year. Right. But it's still there. And when you look back at the history of medicine, you look at Osla, what did he do? They didn't have a bunch of fancy lab tests. They checked the urine for, for glucose. And so they would put them in the hospital, cut their carbs until they weren't peeing glucose anymore. And they said, okay, this is the, well, back then they didn't know the difference between type one and type two. And if you were type one, you were going to die without insulin, right? So they started figuring that out. And so Oslo, the the godfather of medicine that we base all of our practices on now, was doing the same thing we're doing. So this didn't just start with with, uh, Adkins. It didn't just start with, with Dr. Unwin. You know, Jason Fung, he didn't invent fasting, but he is the one saying, yeah, that's reasonable and here's why. So I think when you step back and you start looking, you say, well, this is not just a fad that's going to go away. You know, we're, we're in a major epidemic right now of diabetes, metabolic disease, and we have to fix that or we're going mm-hmm. broke, right? Uh, so I, I think the more people who see that are realizing this is not going away because patients are getting better. It's not like they're losing 20 pounds, and then getting it back, and then losing 20 pounds again, then just staying on that same cycle, right? Uh, if we get people educated, they're going to the, you know, I always kind of joke about it because people ask about it, did you advertise? And I'm not even taking new patients anymore, right? But you get one nail tech or one hairdresser who's lost 80 pounds, how many lives are they going to touch? How many people are they going to talk to? And how yeah. many of those people are going to go take it back to their doctor and go, look, doc, here's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so hopefully we're smart enough to say, okay, what we're doing is not working. It seems to be working. Let me at least look at that. Like when you mentioned the CMEs, right? Right. A doctor, even if they don't believe in it, they say, well, let me learn about it. So at least I'll be educated to say I don't agree with it and here's why. And uh, a lot of times people start out like myself. I looked into it to see how I can discredit it. Right. right? You're skeptical at first. You have to be yeah. skeptical. We have sure. to. That's what we're called to do. And uh, once you start saying, well, I'm having clinical success, I'm having personal success, my patients are doing better, and I'm enjoying pra- the practice of medicine, and I'm doing what, like, what I wanted to do when I had my fancy white coat, right? <laughs> now it's dirty and, and beat up with ink stains. But we're helping patients again. You know, I think the more doctors who experience that, we're getting tons of feedback from docs who learned about it through their patients because yeah. they listened. You know, they sat there and 
in our defense as docs, we have 15 minutes with a patient, if that, sometimes eight minutes. How are you going to fix all these problems that quickly? You know, a lot of us run into lunch or we work late that night because there's a patient we know it's an upfront cost to us. But over time, they're going to benefit. The patient's going to be, be better. And we're not going to be throwing a million drugs with, with interactions and, and problems. Right. 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 Yeah, such a good point. And, you know, I think a big part of the issue, I, I started that question about the, the evidence and, and the evidence of low carb and why people have a hard time accepting it. I think part of the issue is, is the outside world sees doctors as scientists and people who know how to interpret scientific studies well. Um, but that, gosh, that seems like it sure falls flat because we spend so much time talking about the power of nutritional epidemiolog epidemiology or these observational trials. Um, and that's what's informed our practice for, what, 30, 40 plus years. And it seems like with the push for low carb has come the push for let's evaluate the quality of our evidence and, and see what we're basing our decisions on. And that's an awakening that physicians need to have as well. I think that's part of the disconnect with saying, no, 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 we can't go to low carb because look at all this evidence. Look at the, the weight of the evidence. Like you just stick the evidence on a scale and whichever weighs more, you know, that's the right answer rather than looking at the quality of the evidence. So what do you think it takes to, to get doctors to see that as well? You know, I think you have to assess your success. I think you have to step back and look clinically. You know, one of the big eye openers for me was hearing Ivor Cummins talking about Dr. Kraft. Yeah. Saying insulin's the problem. These guys all have high insulin, you know, heart attack, strokes, peripheral vascular disease. They either had diabetes, pre-diabetes, or their doctor missed the diagnosis. Now, this guy's either nuts or doing pathology all these years and looking and actually touching the vessels and looking inside the hearts and, and seeing the damage. Uh, maybe he knew something everyone else wasn't seeing. And, and yeah. he sends a book to all the major medical centers. No one listens. So I went back to my practice after that, after low carb San Diego. And I said, okay, let me look at my patients who had major cardiovascular disease, you know, early strokes, early heart attacks, multiple stents, bypass surgery. And every single one of them had a high insulin level. Yeah. See if they did it. never checked before, right? Yeah. You I never, never checked I before. never looked for insulin ever yeah. in my life. So when you step back and you look and say, wow, is that a, uh, Coincidence? I mean, is it just the odds? Maybe, maybe it's possible, right? So you can't say that's all of it, but you have to say this is contributing. You know, yeah. we're seeing an epidemic of these things and less people are smoking and we're still seeing heart disease. We're seeing all these other uh, factors involved. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously that's when you start saying how much is stress a factor, how much are all the stress raises insulin levels, not sleeping raises insulin levels. So you start looking at lifestyle and saying, okay, like Ben Bickman from BYU says, hey, look, lower your insulin level, make your body as sensitive to insulin as you can, right? Yeah. Watch the stress level, get enough sleep, all, sleep, all these things we're talking about. And then uh, we have to make those changes in our life, right? right. At, at some point. So I think as docs, we're not good at looking at root cause. You know, the, the engineers come in and make us crazy. They say, what's the root cause? Why do you get high blood pressure? Why do all these things run together, right? It's not a shortage of medicines. It's like there's some underlying thing that's causing this problem. When the building falls, they look at all the structural problems that are the possibilities. And then they, they knock one out at a time. Us docs, we don't think that way. We just look at what we've been told and say this got handed down, and we have to understand most of our education is coming from drug companies also right. who have a vested interest. So I had to step back and go, does Jason Fung have a vested interest whether my people fast or not? He doesn't. It really doesn't. He doesn't make more money if I have my people fast, right? So I think it's those kind of things. You have to look at the, what's behind it and the money and, and saying, gosh, who's out to help the patient? Right. right? Yeah, the, the concept of, of follow the money is, is so interesting because – huge organizations like the American Heart Association, you know, sponsored by drug companies, sponsored by cereal making companies and snack food companies, you know, it, and it, it doesn't mean that just by donating, you know, they're dictating what's there, but gosh, why would they be taking money from those companies? There's just the, the, the perception of influence there is just it seems so backwards. And I think all the major medical organizations need to cut themselves off from pharmaceutical companies. But then you get into the low carb sphere, right? And the fasting sphere. And for the most part, I think the majority of the people want to help their patients. But now it seems you, you, we can start to see some of that industry creep in, some of that capitalism creep in. And it's hard to fault people. But now people are pushing products. People are, are, are doing this for profit. Do you think that's going to sort of give low-carb and keto kind of a bad name? That, like, oh, people are just doing this to make money off of it and it's, it's kind of devalue it? 
Absolutely. You know, I look at that, you know, I, I interviewed one of the top nutritionists around and I asked her about heart healthy whole wheat and oatmeal. And yeah. I said, what happens to my cardiovascular risk if I stop eating those things? And she says, your risk goes down. I'm like, but they say it's heart healthy. Yeah, compared to donuts and cake, right? right? So it's a, you know, when I see a sticker on a box that says keto or, or low carb or low fat or heart healthy, I avoid it. I, I don't eat box stuff generally, right? Yeah. So we're defeating the purpose, I think, when we say, okay, we're going to have a bar. I think that's where we run into trouble in the ketogenic low carb sphere is we're saying, I like cookies, but I'm just going to put an artificial sweetener in and eat all the cookies I want. Or I'm going to have uh, uh, more cake or I'm going to have my favorite ice cream. Right? And we're doing that every day all the time. Right. And you're adding a ton of fat and calories and, and, and then you blow it that night. So I'll have a piece of bread or whatever. Then you start wondering why it's not working. Right. So I think there's a lot of that. There's going to be people making money off of it. And there will be good products and bad products and things that help. And th there's things I believe in that I think will help people in a jam. But I think that is going to be more of a tool to help you. If people say, look, I'm not I can't give up my whatever donuts so okay have low carb donuts for a little while and then taper it down just like we would with heroin you get them on methadone <laughs> oh, and God. if you put them on methadone the rest of your li their life you haven't accomplished anything so that's not, i think a lot of us are looking at it that way because we really don't know i think what what's really going to be helpful is when we can look at fasting insulin levels and say hey when i have this artificial sweetener what happens to my insulin because if we're trying mm -hmm. to keep our insulin as low as we can it's not all just about the sugar right and then we look at the processed foods and we're looking at all the seed oils we've been told are good for us and margarine and all these things that we have accepted as being healthy that are not healthy when you look at the data. So I think there's going to be that. That's just p uh, human nature that people are going to try to uh, monopolize, right? Yeah. And like you said, it's if it's not corruption, it's the perception of corruption. So if my podcast is sponsored by a certain company and I push it like crazy, they'll say, well, is he just doing that because he's paid, right? And that's what I respect about Jason. When he joined the podcast, he said, look, we're not going to take any outside money. So we're fortunate enough to be able to raise our own. Look at what di Diet Doctor does. They're not seeing commercials every two seconds. Or if it's a product you really believe in and you really think is helping people, you say, hey, look, we have a vested interest. We're, we're sponsored by this company, and we believe in it, right? Yeah. So, I, you know, I think it's a it's – a, and I don't fault pe people who do that because you got to make a buck at some point. But, you know, I think it's the credibility or the perception of, of uh, corruption. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At Diet Doctor, we sell no ads, we sell no products. And that's so important um, to show we're not influenced, you know, that we really want to provide the best information to help people. But my goodness, when these, when these medical organizations are creating guidelines that is supposed to influence medical practice and they're being funded by pharmaceutical companies, I mean, come on, is it any surprise that they're, you know, they spend 50 pages of their 55 page document talking about drugs and then four pages of references and maybe one page of lifestyle intervention because they don't, you know, lifestyle, people don't make money off of lifestyle, lifestyle intervention. So it's a, it's a sad situation we've gotten ourselves into that we need to get ourselves out of. And if the organizations aren't going to do it, we as indivi individual physicians have to do it. And that's where people like you definitely come in to help turn this tide. Well, and I think that, you know, for that being said, I think a lot of these companies are, they're out to make money. They're, they have, they have shareholders yeah. to answer to. So as this keto thing catches on or low carb or whatever, whatever uh, end of the spectrum going to fall on, they're going to make products that the people are demanding at mm -hmm. some point, right? They're going to advertise and do a lot to get you to stay with what they're making now. Like some of these things are made to be addictive, right? Until yeah. we understand that, you know, I, I mean, if you talk about addictive foods, I mean, they're mostly half fat, half carbs, right? If you look at donuts and you look at pizza, you look at uh, ice cream and all these things. So they're made to be addictive because our body wants to survive, right? right? But very few people go home and binge on turkey by itself or chicken <laughs> or say, I'm just going to eat chicken until I throw up. But you give them Pop-Tarts, you give them, you know, Doritos or something, and they'll be eating them till they, you know, tons of calories of that. So I think it's it's us educating ourselves, saying, look, I'm not going to be a victim. And that's one of the big things. That's what I think a lot of people don't realize with the low-carb and keto movement is so many of my patients now are saying, I'm not hostage to being hungry every two hours. Yeah. Right? I can skip lunch and I don't die. And, and I think the more we do those things and, and have benefit, it's, it gets so much easier, right? Because if you talk to people about fasting, when Jason Fung talks about fasting, you know, I thought this guy's nuts, right? Who wants to not eat when you have food available? Right. But when you start understanding, like if I'm going to run a marathon, I don't start running a marathon the first day. You say, okay, I'll start walking and then I'll jog a little bit. Then I'll do interval training maybe. And then you end up doing that. 
So what we're finding is a natural progression is people will start a low carb diet, then they realize they're not that hungry. They'll skip lunch one day and go, oh, that was not a big deal. I'll skip breakfast tomorrow, right? And, and it's not a huge deal. So, you know, I think we've been sold the bill of goods and that we've all kind of bought into, you know? Yeah, yeah the, it, the fear of hunger is something I, I have to sort of address in so many patients because even if you're not hungry now, you might be hungry later and you've got to prevent that hunger from coming in. Well, no, you really don't because hunger doesn't shut down your body. You know, a little bit of hunger, going a couple more hours. When you learn that it's not that big of a deal, it's really, it, it, it gives you a lot of freedom. And like you're saying, low carb just makes it that much easier. That's why the, the intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, and low carb is such a great combination, which it seems like you've had wonderful success with personally and with your patients. Well, I think when you have data and you have to look, and I've been impressed over the last several months for sure about how adaptable the human body is, right? Yeah. To think that we are so fragile that we have to eat every two hours. In the history of man, was never like this. You know, the farmers would eat a huge breakfast, work all day in the field, right? They didn't stop yeah. every two hours to eat and shut right. all the machines down and, you know, yoke up the horses. And then they would eat a huge dinner at night, right? And then the next day they would do the same thing again and, and, and again. And the hunters would you know, kill something, eat the whole thing, and then go four or five days, kill something again. If they got weak and fatigued, we'd all be dead. We wouldn't be here right now, right? right. So I think all these kind of arguments, you start looking at it. And what I, what I think is really going to bring in the low-carb movement is the continuous glucose monitors, right? Mm -hmm. So if I fast all day, my sugars go up. And if I work out really hard, my sugars go up. So do I need to carb load for my sugar that goes to 143, right? By definition, it's kind of funny because if I wake up in the morning, my sugar's around 85. If I fast all day, it's around 92, 95. Depends how stressful my day is maybe, but my body is providing that sugar. It doesn't mean I have to eat it with each meal, right? And then when I work out, it spikes up like crazy because my body says, uh oh, you need more energy. Let me kick it out into the system. So you start realizing the numbers aren't as scary as we thought they were. You know, Dave Feldman showed that with LDL cholesterol, fasting three days and his LDL goes up by 100 points, right? He eats high fat and it drops by 100 points, just like that in three days. So we're giving people lifelong treatment based on labs that can change drastically, super quickly with lifestyle. Yeah. I want, I want to go back to what you're saying about the CGM. So some people may listen to what you've said and say, wait, it goes up with fasting. It goes up with exercise. That sounds bad. That sounds dangerous. But but it's actually you're using it as a positive example. So explain that a little more. Yeah, because I think a lot of people get concerned about it. when I first started doing this, I reached out to Jason. I said, Jason, look, I'm cutting my carbs like crazy. My fasting sugar in the morning is going up. He goes, yeah, that's good. You should be happy. I'm like, why? He said, well, because your body's breaking down, your glucagon is working. It's kicking the fat stores that you have out into sugar, and you're using it as your energy source. So you don't have to eat sugar all the time. You don't have to eat that to keep your sugars up. So when you start realizing, oh, where's that coming from, and you start understanding why is the body doing that, that's why you know I like that with Dave Feldman talking yeah. about, like, if you, you want to get good cholesterol numbers, we were just talking to someone about that. You know, for the weekend, eat a high fat diet. You add more carbs to your diet if you're low carb and you'll drop your LDL like crazy, right? For the lab test. That's just, it doesn't mean you're healthier doing that, but the labs look better. So the same thing with the continuous glucose monitor. When you start realizing how your body works and how adaptable it is, that I don't have to eat sugar all day long. If my sugar's staying in the 90s all day, when do I need to carb load that? And yeah. especially if I, and I'm not diabetic, I'm metabolically healthy. Now, the caveat will be if you're not fat adapted, right? If you just all of a sudden start fasting, your sugars will drop like crazy because you can't get to your fat stores if your insulin's really high, right? So it's hard at first. That's why fasting has fallen out of favor because unless you're fat adapted, it's super challenging to fast. A lot of people want to do it for religious reasons, mm -hmm. but they're miserable the whole time because their body's saying, where's the sugar? And they're freaking out because they are starving at that point, yeah. right? So once they get fat adapted for a few days before they do it, they do a lot better and it's more of a spiritual act for them rather than than uh, a penance, like a, a, you know, yeah. torturing themselves. Right, thing. it's a great point. It's not that you can't do it if you're not fat adapted. It's just not very pleasant. But if you're fat adapted, it actually can be pretty easy to do. So it's a big difference. Yeah, and and when again, not to harp too much on the CGMs, but I'm I'm as big of a fan of them as you are. So I love talking about them because I think once we get continuous glucose monitors available more often, it's going to change the way we practice medicine is going to change the way people live their life because to have that immediate feedback of what you ate and what it did your blood sugar or not eating and what it does your blood sugar and importantly the area under the curve and that's that's something i talk to patients about all the time because if you wake up with a high blood sugar or it goes up when you exercise or it, it gradually increases when you're fasting what you're concerned about is sort of the area under the curve for the total day 
which is still far better than if you were eating carbs all day and having the spikes up and down. And also the, the, um, the amplitude of the spikes, right? So if your average is 120, but you're getting up to 180 or 190 sometimes and dropping down to 70 sometimes, that's not very healthy. But if your average was 120 and you stayed at 120 the whole time and you stayed at 120 the whole time, that's a healthier way to do that. Now, with fasting, with low carb, that's more along the lines of what your blood sugar's at, and then your average is going to keep dropping over time. So, I mean, these CGMs, Apple keeps saying they're going to come out with a non-invasive one, and I can't, I can't wait until they do because that's going to be a total game changer. Um, do you find you're using them in patients even without diabetes, and that people are getting benefit from them? I am, especially when people aren't sure and they're they're yeah. confused. As a matter of fact, it's funny. I have two uh, nutritionists that I take care of that are diabetes educators. So they came in, and the first thing they each said independently, they don't know each other, they're from two different systems. Each one said, what do you think of this keto stuff that's going around, right? And I said, well, I think it's great, why? And we had this conversation. And each of them, their training is you have to have 50 grams of carbs with each meal. Right. Right? And, and this isn't a diabetic, and I'm talking about non-diabetics. And so we got into this discussion, I showed them my CGM readings, and they were blown away by it. Yeah. And they said, well, what about this big spike you had? Well, it, it spiked up when I was exercising. Yeah. Right? But if I ate something before I exercised, my sugars didn't spike that much because I had another energy source that didn't have to tap in so much to my liver fat stores, right? Not a good thing, but it, it, it made the sugars look a little lower. So I said, look, I'll, each of them, I said, this is your career. This is what you do. It's probably good for you to educate yourself. So why don't you try right. doing what I do for a week and then try to do the ADA recommended diet for a week and see what your sugars did. Yeah. And both of them called me and said, oh my gosh, now what do I do, right? Because when you start seeing that your sugars flatten out and you're non-diabetic, what do you think is doing to the diabetics? Right. Right. That just don't, they, it just doesn't make sense. When you talk logically, you start understanding that's, uh, you know, we're, we're doing crazy stuff because... The big concern when I started low carb, when you asked about how their doctors uh, responded, was well, they said, well, you're, it's dangerous because they can get low sugars. How are they going to get low sugars? You know, because when you have that discussion, it makes right. sense. Because we say, okay, how, much you, how many carbs are you eating for breakfast? Okay, shoot that much insulin to get rid of the carbs. And if they don't eat breakfast, what do you tell them? You don't give them any insulin because they'll get low sugars. Right? Right. So well, once they eat eggs for breakfast, how much insulin do you give them? Well, none, but they can get low sugars from the long acting insulin they're on. Well, why don't you taper that down, right? So once you start realizing we're giving insulin, shoving it into the tissues, right? Uh, it makes a lot of sense not to eat as much, you know, to cut your sugars as much as possible to decrease the amount of insulin. The only difference is we're shoot, someone's shooting insulin versus someone who's producing it from their body, right? right. So either way, we benefit from decreasing our, our body's need for insulin. Yeah, and that, and that's a good point about this need to de-prescribe and doctors need to be aware of that and that's a big part of our push for the CME course because all it takes is one doctor to say, oh yeah, sure, you know, you're on insulin and you're on uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, go try this keto thing and see what happens. Then the patient gets into trouble because they're not being monitored well enough and they're not adjusting their medication. So that's why there there is a certain knowledge base that needs to happen for people who are on diabetes medication specifically. But for people without it, it's a lot easier uh, to implement this. Uh, but that's, you know, I, I also, I've, I've got a couple of patients who, who love the CGMs for the behavior modification part of it. Like that is your... Um, that's your little angel or your devil on your shoulder. When you see what your blood sugar does or you know what it's going to do when you're, you think about eating something different, that it, it makes you say, hang on a second, maybe I don't want to do that because that psychological part with that immediate feedback. And it's, it's something that we, we don't have right now. We don't have a tool other than the CGMs, which can be really expensive for people. Um, so I, don't, I think that's going to be so helpful when we do get that because uh, that behavior modification part, it's a big deal. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's part of our system problem is, look, how much does it cost? Continuous glucose monitor costs about 100 bucks a month, right? How much do you save in insulin use? How much do you save in other medication use? And looking down the road, amputation, you know, the number one cause of amputation, number one cause right. of kidney failure, number one cause of blindness, number one cause of heart disease, right? This disease is major. And until we look at it and say, we got to invest up front, to prevent these problems. You know, until we change that, we're in big trouble as a system, right? We yeah. got to figure that out. Right, right. All right, so let's transition for a second here, though. Now, you, you're you awesome on Twitter, I've got to say. You, you're incredibly witty and funny and poignant and, and point out some great... Um, your your tweets just are, are very um, timely and they, they really impact people, I think. And you post some great success stories about your practice and there's... Uh, it's so positive, 
But, and here comes the but, there's, there has to be some cases that don't turn out so great, right? There has to be some cases where people struggle or they don't do well. Um, so what have you seen there that you think people can, you know, learn a little something from about how to maybe avoid that or, or you know, ways that they can help? Yeah, I think we're in a big learning curve right now. I think we're at a point where why do some people do great? You know, some people flail out. And, you know, I think until we start looking at, at carbohydrates as an addiction, Rob Sivis totally changed my views on this. I argued with him. He's a gastric bypass surgeon for people who don't know who he is, one of the most brilliant guys around, um, uh, trained by Tim Noakes, who knows a little bit about this stuff. Mm -hmm. But he says, look, it's an addiction problem, right? He said, why else would you fill up on steak and be totally stuffed and you can't take another bite? You send the steak away and then they bring your favorite dessert and all of a sudden you have a bite or two. Why? You get the dopamine re release. Uh, so there's definitely, we, have, we say I'm addicted to chocolate, we say these things, but people don't really believe in the addiction part of it. So that's a huge, huge deal. And that's why when you talk about the artificial sweeteners and all that stuff, you know, it's one of those things, if we're using it as a crutch to get you off of that sweet taste, but eventually you have to get rid of that sweet taste that you're craving all the time, right? And so I think th there's a lot of people that's just, I'll give you an example. I have a lady, she's, I just saw her for a pre-op for gastric bypass surgery. She works at the hospital and we put her on a ketogenic low carb diet. In the first month, she lost eight pounds, right? She resolved her, her hot flashes she has all the time. Her back pain got better. Her anxiety got better. All this stuff got better in one month. With only eight pounds. With only eight pounds of weight loss. So yeah. then I saw her in three month follow up, which probably was a mistake on my side, right? And She's, I asked her about it and she said, oh, I did great for a month. My mood was good and I was clear and all that. And I said, why'd you stop? And she said, well, I only lost eight pounds, so I stopped. Right? Yeah. All of her life's of her blood pressure, everything got better, right? Because eight pounds, so we're so concerned. I think, that's, I think that's one big thing is people have seen stories and heard stories about someone loses 100 pounds, 150 pounds. Not everyone's like Tro Collagen, right? Tro lost weight like from 350 pounds. Now he has a 32 inch waist and he's an athlete. Me, I've been struggling low carb and doing all this stuff and my weight comes down slowly but surely. So I have to be patient. So yeah. at some point you have to trust the process. I think the people who fail out are the ones who don't trust the process. You know, they haven't seen enough, but then they'll run into their neighbor who's lost a bunch of weight and they go, okay, I'm going to do it again. But then you realize, hey, you don't have to eat butter all day long. Do you want to burn your own fat or do you want to eat butter as your fat source, right? So I think it depends where you're at. Someone who's lean and fit like you can get away with a lot more than I can get away with trying to get down, right? It's kind of, I tell people it's like a, when you're trying to, uh, keep your car running, right? Some people just need a little bit of a tune-up. Some people just need an oil change. Some people need a major overhaul. Right. So I'm going to manage you differently if you're diabetic and your sugars are 350 compared to, you know, if you're you're five pounds from your goal weight, right? So we all are going to have a different approach we're going to have to take. And I think a lot of us on Twitter, getting back to that a little bit, is we battle it out over the minutia, right? The minutia, because you're going to figure out, look, whether you're vegan or whether you're carnivore, you cut out the garbage processed stuff in the middle, you know, the, the bad seed oils and, and those kind of things, and you do better. And then you fall on whatever end of the spectrum you're gonna fall on, right, based on your preferences. Uh, it doesn't mean you're an idiot because your diet's different than mine. So you see these things on Twitter where people get into huge cussing fights and you know, bring up personal stuff about being divorced or whatever it is, it's totally outside of what we're talking about, right? Yeah. We, we get distracted from what the original point was. So I think you know, it's those kind of things where we, we start seeing um, uh, you know, we're, that we're all individuals. And I think the big thing I've learned is it's not an, a one size fits all. It's an yeah. N of one for you, what works for you, right? If you say, hey, I eat meat twice a week and I feel great, perfect. If you eat it once every five years and you feel great, perfect, whatever. So figuring out what works for you and then going with it. And I think each of us has to experiment enough and have the courage to experiment to figure out what works for us individually. Yeah, it's a good point you bring up about the um, the example that people set of, I lost 100 pounds, I lost you know 150 pounds. And then everybody says, oh, I'm going to do that too. And it's going to work for me the exact same way. Well, it's probably going to work for you, but it might not work in the exact same way. And I think that's a really important point that you bring up. And, and the, the different concept between health and weight like you said, that woman, so many things improved for her, but her weight was slow to decrease. And it's when you, if you focus too much on weight, you can sort of lose the health benefits. And a lot of the times when I talk to people, it's about being patient and being patient and pointing out all the benefits that come along the way besides just weight. So I think that was a great point you brought up. Well, and just to 
put a punctuation mark on that. I have a guy, he, that he's Italian, which is a tough sell for keto, low carb. And, and he was at the point where we were maxed out on his oral meds. We had to put him on insulin or he had to change his lifestyle. And his daughter shook her head and said, he's not going to do it, doc. He's not, you know, he eats pasta every day and all this. Yeah. So I said, look, here's your options. We could do this or we could do this. Or we put you on insulin. He goes, no, I'm not doing insulin. I see what happens to people. I'm, I'm changing my lifestyle. Three weeks later, he comes in. He lost three pounds, but he normalizes sugars from over 200 down to like 110 yeah. consistently, right? On a three pound weight loss. So it doesn't have to be that you lose 100 pounds because... When it's liver fat, that's a whole different, you know, like Jason and some of Jason Fung and some of these people are talking about your liver being like a suitcase. If it's totally full, you got to hire a bunch of people to shove more fat into that suitcase, right? Which is the carbohydrates that we're shoving in there. But once you empty that down a little bit, you become more efficient. You have a little bit of a backup battery. Hopefully mm -hmm. that makes sense to people where it's not overcharged all the time, but that you can deplete it either through cutting your carbohydrates or intermittent fasting. Both of those work. It's just what works for you. Right. right? Right. I'm always jealous of people who can come up with like the great analogies like Jason or even like Dave Feldman. Like I, I can't come up with analogies like that. That always makes me so jealous. That, wow. They're really good at analogies, but I get the concept. I get the concept that you can, you can normalize your blood sugars, improve your insulin resistance, reduce your, your liver fat without decreasing your body weight tremendously. You can see those health benefits. And there was actually a great study that came out showing that um, regardless of weight loss, you can improve metabolic health with low carb. I mean, it's it's out there in the literature in a double blind randomized study. The studies we need to see, we just need to get those in front of more doctors so they understand. But anyway, I've been harping on that enough. Um, I want to transition for a second to your, I guess you could say, new part of your career. For about a year now, you've been the the host with Troclasian of Low Carb MD podcast. So how's that been going? Oh, it's been great. It's it's so much yeah. fun, you know. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos, uh, you know, help us out, and it's been great because we really wanted to reach frontline docs. We want to reach people who gave up. You know, we've had people on that were 675 pounds or 679 pounds. I I got corrected, and uh, dropping onto the 280s, less than 300 pounds, low carb Q after failing a gastric bypass surgery, yeah. right? So when you start hearing from all these frontline docs, because that's what changed my view. And I think that's what when, when you're talking about your CMEs and what you're trying to do, we have to get doctors to understand the benefit. You have to understand like there's other people out there. I'm not the only one and I wasn't the only one. Right. I was fortunate enough when we were giving our talk, which that was nice of you to join me and give me some credibility when I was first starting out. Uh, to the church group, right? And we, we had a bunch of people and, and the two keto dudes let me come on and talk about all this stuff. And we got a few people from that. And I think having a platform, I realized there's a benefit to having frontline docs who said, yeah, I'm in this little town here and look what I'm seeing. Look at Dr. Unwin from this little town in England. No, yeah. None of us ever would have heard of him. So we're having all these great docs come on and nurse practitioners and PAs who get it and they're having clinical success. So the more people hear that it's not just Brian who thinks he's some crazy guy out there making up stuff, right? And he has some vested interest. I think when you start realizing there's a ton of us out there who are benefiting, right? And having, you know, for me, diet doctor as a resource, are you kidding me? When I'm in Guatemala, I was overwhelmed because I saw the, the devastation. You know, everyone's drinking soda and their sugar's 300 and they go, well, mm. I quit eating dessert man, that, that soda is killing you, right? That's the problem. But I could teach, I could send them to a diet doctor in Spanish, right? And they could learn and not have to do, you know, so I think that we all have our niche and our, our super, it's super important. You know, I think drawing battle lines and saying, okay, I want my podcast to be more successful than yours, you know, because I listen to Ivra Cummins, I, I listen to peak uh, human nutrition, all these things. And, and you start realizing all these good people are out there trying to help people, right? Yeah. And, and so... I think that's what we're seeing is, is people are starting to hear people like you and what you're doing as a cardiologist, uh, Nadir Ali, you, you know, we have so many frontline people, um, docs, cardiologists, we, and we're seeing benefit in the realm of psychiatry. And so mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're all putting our piece of the puzzle together, right? Me as a frontline doc, I'm not a researcher, so I'm not going to be able to give you a ton of research evidence. But I rely on those people to do it, right? And I rely on people uh, like Dave Feldman who are, are bringing changes to our whole paradigm of what LDL cholesterol is and how it works because we we all just thought that was the killer right that's all we knew back then when we were in residency right. was keep your LDL as low as you can but are there other factors involved is insulin play a role in oxidizing LDL into the bad stuff or damaging the endothelium the lining of the blood vessels so I think all of us are starting to put our little piece of the puzzle together and we all need each other to make that happen, yeah. right? So, I, you know, I, that's what I think is exciting is seeing, you know, this whole 
having our podcast and the success with, you know, we don't have a fancy setup like you with, with all cool <laughs> stuff and you get it all. I mean, it's, this is super awesome. Uh, Troy and I just throw on some headsets and start talking to people, right? Because we we believe it's the content, right? It's the content. Mm. We want to get out to as many people and we, we self-fund, so we're not taking a, a kickbacks from anyone, anything like that. But we can bring on people who have new products that might be helpful because we have no vested interests, right? Other than saying, hey, this may help you as a tool. And I think a lot of us are, are doing those kind of things and saying, hey, there's other people doing this. And I think for us, the vested interest really for ourselves is having more docs out there and that becomes the standard of care. Yeah. What we have to do is change the standard of care because what we're doing clearly isn't working, right? Right. So doing more of the same just isn't going to work. It's yeah. just not going to work, I'm telling you. So we have to change. And when you start seeing success stories, they're hearing, you know, stories of people controlling their seizure disorder on a ketogenic diet that are real people it's not a before and after picture that we could doctor this is their story right yeah. so the more you hear these stories and you see the docs who who've sacrificed who've been through a lot you, you hear about get gary fetke right and what he went through and tim noakes i mean they i'm not a conspiracy theory guy but they just got you know uh, they went through a lot they sacrificed a ton so what we're doing is kind of easy because it's like they took the hill and we're just running up behind them saying hey we did it guys right so there's so many great people out there. And when you meet them personally, as you know, you've interviewed a lot of people. You see with their integrity and what they're doing. You, you look at someone like Rob Sivas. He's a gastric bypass surgeon. He has endless supply of, of patients. And he's saying, hey, we can avoid surgery in a lot of you, right? Let's, yeah. let's do something different. Gary Fetke can amputate everyone's feet. Or he could say, let's prevent this. From, that's why we went into medicine, to prevent the problems. Even me as a primary, people say, well, how many have you taken off insulin? For me, it's like, how many have I prevented from going on it in the first place? Right, even more powerful. Yeah, and it's even more powerful. And it's not me doing it. It's the patient saying, look, I'm not just going down that road because they've been told they have a chronic progressive disease that's irreversible. Yeah. So when they can reverse it and their A1C is coming down and they're, they have that little bit of leeway now, uh, it's exciting, right? It's fun because it, 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 there's hope. You know, I think, uh, I think Dr. Unwin is so on top of it saying, look, when we have hope, we do better. When people have hope that they can lose 20 pounds or 50 pounds or, you know, just starting where they're at now and getting better every day, you know, for all of us. I think that there's a lot to be said about that. And that's what medicine's about, too, to give you hope. And you hopefully trust your docs. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things is, is I get a lot of people that want to come to me because they say my doc doesn't get it. Well, you have a good doc. Let's train them. Let's teach them. You yeah. know, have them do this game. You at least care enough about your doc. Not just say, OK, you don't agree with me in this. I'm not going to listen because the doctor has heard it all already. They've heard the HCG diet. They've heard the grapefruit diet, this diet, that diet, and none of them have worked long term. Why? Because you have to change your underlying metabolic health, right? And that's what we're talking about is if we do that, we're going to have long term success, not losing 50 pounds in a month. And then you go back to eating what you were doing, right? right. So a lot of people have that view and until you understand it's lifestyle, it's stress management, all these things we talk about, uh, they're not going to have success doing anything, right? Yeah. You have to buy in and you have to believe at some point. And, and that's the next stage. I mean, that's where we have to get. It's just more physicians on board and it's going to come from patients. It's going to come from podcasts like yourself and like mine. And it's going to come from us as vocal advocates, but not as as like fringe, this fixes everything. This is the one magic thing. I mean, we have to be honest about it. It's a process like anything. It's got its place and it's got some time where you have to be careful or maybe it doesn't work as well. And I think as long as we can keep promoting that message to as many people as possible, the doctors have to start hearing it, especially if it's coming from patient success stories. So that was a great point because I get a lot of questions too about my doctor doesn't get it. My doctor isn't on board. Can you help me find a new doctor? And the answer frequently should be help me educate your doctor let's help us you know together we can work to educate your doctor to try and transform them maybe they're not going to you know become a, a low-carb doctor who uses it for everybody but at least to be knowledgeable about it be aware of it understand that it's one more tool in the toolkit that is going to help people because that's why we're here and that's what we're doing trying to help people Right. Yeah. And I think that's just understanding that of having them have a big picture of stepping back and say, why is the sugar going up? Yeah. Why is the LDL going up with in any type of weight loss? It's going to go up because your body's kicking more energy into the system. So I think when you start being less fearful and understanding, it's like, OK, this is going to be normal for a couple months. Let's let it ride and let's let's stick with it because it's that initial panic people get. So I warn my patients, I go, your LDL is going to go up for three months. It's going to. And, and surprisingly, I see a lot of people, their LDL drops right away and they feel good about it. Right. And their triglycerides, HDL definitely go the right way. And their blood pressure gets better and they're coming off meds. So I think riding it out through that time and, you know, and, and Brett, 
as a as a little plug for you, I I can't help it. You know, when I saw that you were doing low carb, that gave it a ton of credibility to me. And that was before I knew a heck of a lot. Because I know you look at the data, you assess things, right? You're not just going to jump on the latest fad that's happening. And you play the devil's advocate and you go, what about people who say this? What about people who have this concern? I think that there's value to that because we have to understand enough to either defense what we're saying or realize there's no defense for certain things. Say, yeah, that's not a good situation for this. Pro- it's not a one-size-fit-all, right? So, And I think that's really important where you have reasonable people who say, let me weigh the evidence and show what the evidence shows, right? So I felt a heck of a lot more confident when you were doing this too, that I wasn't in the boat by myself, some primary guy, guy, care guy doing this stuff. But when you start seeing all the world experts who've looked at the data and say, I've weighed it and I'm looking and I'm looking at clinical experience, putting them together and saying, there's a problem, we got to fix this thing, yeah. right? So I that's appreciate my you, you saying man. that. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thank you. Am I blushing? Can you see? All right, well, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Well, this has been great. I really enjoyed talking to you about all this and getting your experience, and I highly recommend people check out Low Carb MD Podcast and to follow you on Twitter because, like I said, it, you make me crack up at least once or twice a day. It, it's great. It's great. But where else would you recommend people go to find you and any last words for our audience? Yeah, you know, I'm not accepting new patients now. I do do some consulting through uh, Low Carb Advisor. Um, for people who are just trying to get on track to understand lifestyle and health and, and what their labs might mean and help hopefully work with their doctor to educate the doctor. And that's one of the good things. I know you were doing that for a while too. And yeah. when you educate the doctor, you go, look, here's what it means. And I think so a lot of us, our value is going to be in educating the doctor. Then what happens is as you have more doctors, then we're not in so much demand, right? So that we there's enough sick people to go around. And so the more of us we get in, we realize our system's in trouble. So the more docs we bring in, the more practitioners we bring in, you know, that, that understand and can help their patients. Then they don't, you know, I, Andy Fung, you know, is a great guy, low carb keto guy. And people are driving six hours to see the guy. Wow. Right. And so people are going across town to see Tro College. They're flying across the country to see Tro. Right. So I think when you start realizing, gosh, if, why don't we have someone in Kansas City? Why don't we have someone in, in Orange County? Why don't we have someone who gets this stuff so that the patients can get cared for by people who get it? Right. So I think that's the huge thing about diet doctor. What we're all doing is saying, let's bring more people into the fold who get it. And then the quality, the, the standard of care and the quality of care both change, right? Yeah. So I think it's just, it's, it's coming. It's just being patient, like we tell people with, with low-carb diets, right? You're not going to lose 80 pounds in a week. ain't going to happen, right? It's not going to happen. But you can say, okay, let me start exercising now. Let me start doing this little tweak. And I think that's what we're doing in medicine. The more people who get it, and then they have clinical experience, and they go to their partners. And, you know, like I've done with my partners, they're asking about keto, low-carb. What is insulin level? What does this mean? And so we become educated, and we educate others. And then we yeah. just pass along. You don't hold that secret to yourself. You, you, you pass along, and hopefully, you know, through Diet Doctor and all these other podcasts, we're, we're reaching people. I know we're reaching people. We get calls from doctors all the time thanking us that they're starting to see things differently, and their patients are doing better, and they're enjoying medicine again. That's kind of cool. That's awesome. That, that's a great impact to have in helping, helping them help more people patients. That's the way, where it's at. All right. Well, thanks. This has been great. And I look forward to hearing more from you on, on your podcast and what comes next in your future. All right. We're going to have you on, man. All right. Sounds All right. good. Appreciate it. Thank All you right. for having thanks. me.